This week, the center of the church's year is one of striking contrasts. Jesus rides into Jerusalem surrounded by shouts of glory, only to be left alone to die on the cross, abandoned by even his closest friends. Mark's gospel presents Jesus in his complete human vulnerability, agitated, grieved, scared, forsaken. Though we lament Christ's suffering and all human suffering, we also expect God's salvation. In the wine and bread, Jesus promises that his death will mark a new covenant with all people. We enter this holy week thirsty for the completion of God's astonishing work. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The first reading is from the 50th chapter of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is from the 31st psalm. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. Like the dead, I am forgotten. Out of mind, I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. The second reading is from the second chapter of Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Today's gospel is from the 14th and 15th chapter of Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. 
So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping the bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, 
Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. <clears throat> While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, 
and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. And after mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him along themselves, among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead and summoning the centurion. He asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Hosanna, crucify him. These both were shouted by the crowds concerning Jesus when he was in Jerusalem. He was welcomed with palm branches, but ended up on a cross. That is the stark contrast of today's festival. Jesus is welcomed, but he is welcomed into his sacrifice. What does the cross mean for us? What do we learn particularly from Jesus' death, which guides us in our discipleship on this Sunday before the holiest of weeks? It's surely more than one sermon can contain, which is why in normal times we gather, not only today, but Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, in order to rehearse the final days of Jesus. When we can gather, it's important to do so because the passion of Jesus 
is not just a story you learn about from a distance, but something that through the church you live, participate in. Rabbis teach the Jewish people that each of them should consider themselves to have personally come out of the Exodus. In other words, that they should consider themselves as much as their ancestors to have been led out of slavery and into freedom by the hand of God. As for us, the services of Holy Week allow us to sit with the first disciples around the table with Jesus and to hear him say, this is my body, this is my blood. They allow us to also be at the foot of that barren cross and to hear the last words of Jesus and then to wait with all of creation, holding our breath to see what God might do next. We will do these things at a distance from one another this holy week, but as we do so, we know that Jesus is not at a distance from us. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's perhaps a minor part of the great story, but one that carries much meaning. The curtain was the cloth that separated the most holy space of the temple from all other spaces. And that space was the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest himself would go in only once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to burn incense and sprinkle animal blood in order to atone for the sins committed by the people in the last year. It was the space in which God was thought to be especially present. And yet, when Jesus dies, the story tells us that the curtain is torn. That curtain which was the barrier between where God lived and where we live. That curtain which was the barrier between God's holiness and our sin, between the sacred and the profane. That curtain, which could only be crossed by one priest and only with great fear and trembling, is torn from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, by an act of God. The act of sending his son to die upon the cross. Jesus' death does away with the separation between God and humankind caused by our sin. Now God's presence and grace are not limited to one holy space, but rather God is to be found wherever the story of Jesus is told, wherever faith believes and believers eat and drink the body and blood of God's only Son. The sin which once separated us from God is forgiven. And here I will ask you to take all that I have said personally. Often in conversation, when we either accidentally or intentionally cause offense, we will say, don't take it personally. But in this case, if we don't take what this story tells us personally, then it will remain an item of historical interest that will not speak to our lives. The sins which you have done, which would separate you from God, are done away with in the death of Jesus. That which would separate you from God is forgotten, gone in the name of Christ. That is the good news for you. That is the gospel from which springs the joy of Christian life and informs all that we do. But it will not inform what we do if we don't take it personally. You are saved by the cross of Christ. Jesus' last words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Without knowing where those words come from, we might be led to believe that somehow in his last moments, Jesus himself lost faith that his determination had left him, that he now felt utterly abandoned by the God whom he had preached. But in fact, Jesus is quoting scripture, the first line of Psalm 22. It's true that this is a psalm of lament. David had found himself surrounded by adversity, and so he cries out to the Lord, why are you so far from helping me? Jesus joins in the words of that lament in his final moments. But as many have pointed out, one does not cry out, even in lament, to a God that one does not believe in. And even as David in Psalm 22 acknowledges both his trouble and his limitations, he also acknowledges the greatness of God. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. 
All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. I'm captivated by that last line, the final one of the psalm that Jesus begins quoting as his earthly life ends. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. From Jesus' perspective, you are those future generations. You are that people that was yet unborn who, because of God's actions that day, have heard about God. You are part of those families of all nations that were welcomed into the fold of God in the name of Jesus. Jesus seems you to want to take this personally. At his death, he says the words of a psalm, which, though it begins in lament, ends up talking about all those who will believe, in other words, about you. And since Jesus talks about us from the cross, it's only right we talk about him personally. And here is perhaps where we Lutherans fall down on the job even more profoundly than other churches. We tend to be so humble that we will not even brag about Jesus, but that is what we're called to do. To own and embody what Jesus has done for us, is doing, and promises yet to do. To speak of Jesus and God out loud as the subject of active verbs. To speak of him personally as a person, since that's what he is, though he is also God. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out loud with a loud voice, and then he died. And at the end of our gospel, a stone is rolled in front of his tomb. For all the disciples, this was the end of hope. The curtain of the temple was once the barrier between God and man, but now the barrier is this stone which holds the body of Christ. He is dead, he is buried, and all our hopes with him. How could this happen if he is truly God's son? If he has died, does it not throw into doubt all the teachings he gave us, all the words of comfort and of faith which so strengthened us? How he taught us to call God Father and to give thanks for our daily bread. If he is dead and the tomb is closed, has not this bright chapter of faith also been closed? Closed this way of living, closed this life of discipleship, of joy, and of service. Is it over? God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion.
fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, let us now pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord, in Jesus you came among us as a suffering servant. Give your church humility. Redeem your people from pride and the certainty that we always know your will. Heal and empower us to confess Christ. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect all from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Jesus was handed over to the powers of the world. In all nations, instruct the powerful that they would not exploit their power, but maintain justice. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. On the cross, Jesus joined all who are forsaken. Abide with those who are condemned to death. Defend those who are falsely accused. Console and strengthen those who are mocked or bullied. Accompany all who suffer, especially those we now name, aloud or in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You called followers to tend to Jesus in death. Sustain hospice workers, nurses, and doctors. Strengthen all who accompany those dealing with loss. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You inspired the centurion to confess Jesus as your son. We praise you for the faith you have given to all people of all times and places. Give us also such faith to trust the promises of baptism and with them to look for the resurrection of the dead. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Now let us pray using the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.